Bien, pues muy buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos a la presentación de Contra la Democracia de Jason Brennan. Jason, welcome to Madrid. Eh, yo quería empezar eh, dando las gracias pues, a todos vosotros por acompañarnos hoy aquí. Dar las gracias también a Value School eh, por habernos invitado a celebrar aquí esta presentación. Y dar las gracias a Juan Ramón Rayo, también aquí presente, por... Uh, dedicarnos también su tarde y también en nombre del Juan de Mariana por participar en esta colección que como sabéis eh, publicamos a tres bandas, Value School, eh, Juan de Mariana y Deusto y del, de la que el libro de Brennan es eh, el tercer libro que publicamos. Empezamos el año pasado con un texto del padre Juan de Mariana, tratado de la moneda de Bellón. Continuamos en otoño con el progreso de Norberg y este es el tercer libro y se irán sucediendo libros en periodicidad de dos a, al año. El siguiente es otro texto de Juan de Mariana que rescataremos. El libro que publicamos hoy es un libro provocativo, como el título mismo indica, y que eh, es una uh, disertación sobre la democracia. No es en absoluto algo que vaya en contra de la, de la democracia, de hecho... Uh, Dice siempre Jason que la, 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 lo que conocemos como las democracias liberales han sido los países más uh, prósperos, sobre todo en las últimas décadas, pero siempre hemos visto que eh, la democracia a veces tiene, tiene problemas, ¿no? Es decir, no es perfecta. De lo que se trata básicamente no es de ponerla en tela de juicio, sino sobre todo de ver a qué alternativas uh, tenemos. Básicamente la, la idea es que la, la democracia es un instrumento, es decir, no tiene que ser un fin en sí mismo, sino simplemente es un instrumento que nos sirve para organizarnos como sociedad. Pero si encontramos un instrumento mejor, como él dice, un martillo mejor, el Better Hammer, eh, pues no tenemos eh, en principio que eh, oponernos a, a ello, ¿no? O sea, a menudo eh, vemos que la democracia pues, seguramente es el, el, el mejor de los peores sistemas y eh, vemos también pues, que si hay ocasiones donde se pone en tela de juicio. ¿no? Pues, por ejemplo, eh, el Brexit, donde votó sobre todo a favor de salir de la Unión Europea la población de más edad, eh, no porque supieran o creyeran que le convenía al país, pero seguramente porque creyeron que les convenía a ellos. ¿no? La propia elección de Trump en Estados Unidos o, sin ir más lejos, la moción de censura que vivimos aquí la semana pasada, eh, que fue eh, la investidura, o motivó la investidura de Pedro Sánchez, perfectamente legítima, evidentemente, pero sí que es cierto que el mismo día de la investidura los sondeos indicaban que en el 60 y 70% de la población no prefería un nuevo gobierno, sino nuevas elecciones. Lo que viene a explicar a Jason básicamente es que solemos pensar ¿no? que eh, el, la sociedad se reparte entre, entre hobbits, que son aquellos que votan indistintamente, sin prestarle demasiado interés, podemos llamar que son políticamente ignorantes, que son maleables, eh, que votan de manera muy influenciable. Luego tenemos a los hooligans, que son los que son más activos, que participan más, pero que al mismo tiempo son también los más partidistas y lo que vienen a llamar los, los vulcanos, ¿no? que son aquellos que en principio votan de una, una manera concienzuda, es decir, que piensan muy bien y estudian muy bien todas las alternativas que tienen para votar y votan en conciencia. Bien, lo que dice Jensen es que estos no existen y que debemos uh, de desengañarnos. Eh, recupera luego como, para, como hilo conductor lo que la teoría que ya platónica del gobierno de los sabios, del gobierno de los más sabios, eh, la, la epistocracia y propone una serie de medidas uh, que quizá podrían funcionar para conseguir que la democracia fuera eh, una, una herramienta más eficaz. Por ejemplo, pues que eh, votaran los mejores, los más preparados o los que demostraron cierto interés, los que quizás se hubieran eh, registrado eh, de manera previa. No, no es el único que lo dice, incluso hay a filósofos, pensadores como Daniel Ineriarte, que mismo en España, donde ya han planteado cosas parecidas ¿no? y, han, y han planteado que quizá el voto de los jóvenes debería contar más o valer de un modo distinto eh, que el resto de, de votos. 
Pero bueno, para hablar de todo eso, para hablar de la democracia y para hablar de sus alternativas, tenemos hoy a Juan Ramón Rayón, director de Instituto Juan de Mariana, y al autor del libro Jason Brennan. Lo cual voy a hacer la palabra a Juan para que nos haga su disertación y a continuación tendrá la palabra a Jason. Y ya por último, pues abriremos el debate para todo aquel que quiera hacer alguna aportación, algún comentario o simplemente expresar su punto de vista. Nada más, bienvenidos. Muchas gracias por venir y le cedo la palabra a Juan. Por venir desde, desde Estados Unidos eh, para, bueno, pues para presentar la traducción de este libro al castellano y también para compartir sus reflexiones con, con nosotros. Eh, la verdad que Value School merece las gracias por un doble motivo. Primero, por ceder estas magníficas instalaciones que ya disfrutamos en Liberación y también por haber contribuido decisivamente a que esta colección y en particular este libro puedan llegar a, a publicarse. ¿Y por qué este libro? Es decir, ¿por qué al final decidimos pues, bueno, cuál era la motivación de progreso? Pues mostrar que el mundo, en contra de lo que se suele decir, en contra de lo que los populistas de izquierdas y de derechas eh, les gusta decir, no está yendo a peor, sino que todo lo contrario está yendo a mejor y que, por tanto, mucha de la justificación a favor de una mayor intervención gubernamental en ámbitos muy diversos, que se basa precisamente en ese catastrofismo infundado, no tiene sentido. ¿Y por qué eh, publicamos contra la democracia o quisimos publicar contra la democracia? Porque en cierta medida la, la democracia se ha convertido en un tótem incuestionable, en una verdad revelada que se coloca por encima de los derechos y de las libertades individuales. Es decir, al final el origen de la libertad individual básicamente se, se coloca en, en la voluntad del pueblo. Esto, desde un punto de vista económico, sabemos que ya implica un error... Es decir, la voluntad popular como tal no existe. Esto es un resultado muy viejo, el teorema de la imposibilidad de Arrow. No existe nada parecido a la voluntad del pueblo. Si cambiamos las reglas, las mismas preferencias individuales se agregan de una manera distinta en forma de preferencia social. Y además, incluso aunque tuviéramos un sistema de reglas de agregación de preferencias más o menos estable, previsible, transparente, eh, y esto es algo en lo que la obra de Jason incide mucho, eh, la materia prima con la que se termina confeccionando eh, el output electoral es una mala materia prima. Es decir, el votante tiene muchos incentivos para ser ignorante, básicamente porque su voto cuenta muy poquito dentro del agregado. Además tiene sesgos de partida que le orientan a votar al margen de toda la evidencia. Y por si fuera poco, aquellas personas que supuestamente podrían tener alguna resistencia más contra los sesgos, es decir, aquellas personas que se interesan más en la política, que leen más, que se informan más, normalmente suelen ser las más sesgadas, las más eh, polarizadas, las más partidistas, las que más eh, se tiran los trastos a la cabeza y las que más se llegan a, a enfrentar. Entonces, la democracia, en ese sentido, en lugar de, de producir algo parecido al interés general, termina produciendo lo que ya desde Tocqueville es la dictadura de la mayoría, ¿no? o, 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 el, o el output de las mayorías electorales impuesto sobre las, las minorías. En el caso de España tenemos un ejemplo, yo creo, muy claro, de cómo ya no solo la democracia, sino la política, que en cierta medida creo que el libro de Jason originalmente iba un poco por ahí, ¿no? Contra la política, eh, pues cómo la política puede terminar matando una sociedad. Es decir, en Cataluña la mitad de la sociedad odia a la otra mitad y la otra mitad odia a la primera mitad, justamente porque tienen proyectos de sociedad absolutamente irreconciliables, al menos desde un punto de vista eh, comunitario. Con lo cual, eh, cada uno consume su propia prensa, consume sus propios argumentos, eh, reafirma sus propias ideas y además se reafirma en el odio contra los demás. Cada bando eh, se, se, se cohesiona más internamente y se enfrenta más con el otro. Todo por proyectos políticos irreconciliables, porque esas mismas personas luego pueden ir al, a ver el Barcelona o el Español y llevarse estupendamente sin conocer sus afiliaciones políticas. Pero es cuando meten las afiliaciones políticas en medio, es decir, cuando uno se está planteando eh, no qué hacer con su propia vida, sino también qué hacer con la vida de los demás, donde evidentemente el otro se pone a la defensiva y dice, si tú quieres gobernar mi vida, yo tengo que pararte los pies y cómo te paro los pies controlando el poder político, que a su vez implica controlar tu vida. Entonces, 
Todo esto, que creo que es bastante obvio, que genera unos incentivos perversos para la armonía social, de alguna manera se ha terminado eh, anestesiando con el jarabe democrático, con la idea, ya digo, de que la democracia somos todos y que, por tanto, nada malo puede eh, acaecer si nos gobernamos a nosotros mismos. Y por eso creo que libros como, como el de Jason son tan necesarios eh, al margen de, de las propuestas prácticas de pistocracia que se puedan plantear, eh, creo que el decir la democracia no es ni infalible ni intrínsecamente valiosa, sino que es eh, un instrumento que además falla mucho eh, y comparar cómo además se puede cuestionar la democracia desde su misma esencia, es decir, desde el igualitario reparto del poder político, diciendo no es que a lo mejor el poder político tiene que estar desigualitariamente repartido en función de, del conocimiento, las aptitudes, el interés que tiene cada uno en participar en, en política, lo que nos lleva a plantearnos desde una perspectiva, perspectiva ya más liberal, que no es la que necesariamente enfoca el libro de, de Jason, que es un libro más aséptico en ese sentido, otros desde luego sí tienen mucha más carga de liberal, pero este no necesariamente, pero sí desde una perspectiva liberal nos lleva a plantearnos, eh, bueno, si la democracia ni es buena en sí misma, ni es un instrumento eh, perfecto, sino que además tiende a generar eh, problemas sociales artificiales derivados de la misma existencia de una extensión de la acción política democratizada a ámbitos donde no debería estar, quizá eh, lo ideal, ya digo, desde una perspectiva liberal es que la política democrática o no, cope cada vez menos espacios. Es decir, permitir que cada persona se autogobierne o que se relacione con otros eh, de, de, de buena voluntad y de, de mutuo acuerdo. Y, y no, por tanto, sometiendo todo ámbito de nuestras vidas o casi todo ámbito de nuestras vidas al, al convenio y a la voluntad eh, colectiva expresada a través de las urnas. Y, y este es el motivo por el que hemos publicado este libro y por el que tenemos a Jason aquí. Muchas gracias. Bien. Uh, gracias a ustedes por estar aquí. Hola. Bueno, dos. Okay. Gracias a ustedes por estar aquí conmigo esta noche. Esta noche uh, es uh, primera vez para estar aquí en España. Y uh, estoy muy encantado lo que, uh, de que el uh, Instituto Juan de Mariana ha traducido el libro en español. Pero no recuerdo mucho de las palabras sobre filosófica o político en español. Y uh, después yo voy a hablar en inglés. Uy, uh, so, anyways, thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to be here. So, with that, I'd like to get into it. Uh, I want to ask the question Is democracy just? Is it just? Right? Can we do better than pure democracy? Are there alternatives that are worth considering? And I think the answer is yes. So we want to start by asking, why do governments sometimes do bad things? Why do they sometimes make mistakes? Why do injustices occur? Well, there are lots of people to blame. We can blame special interest groups that will make deals with governments on the side and will run government for their own benefit at the expense of everyone else. You can blame my neighbors. I live and work in the Washington, D.C. area, and my neighbors are bureaucrats and lobbyists and those sorts of people who secretly run the government while the politicians talk, and they sometimes run the government for their own interests. You can blame you know, the unions and the corporations who do other kinds of bad things. Lots of people are to, are to blame, but when we're done blaming them, we should take our finger and do one of these. Because at the end of the day, democracy works, and that should scare you. What I mean by democracy working is, Democracy does have a strong tendency to deliver the kinds of policies and the kinds of ideas that average people want. But what if it turns out that average people don't have much idea about what they're talking about? Say, in many issues when it comes to politics, we're talking about international relations and whether we should have war or peace and how we should get it. What if the average person doesn't know much about international relations? What if they don't even know where the countries are on the map that we're currently bombing? That was more case for my country than yours, of course. Um, What if we ask about economic issues, but they don't understand not only economics itself, but even the basics about what's happening? What if it turns out the average voter, as they do, has a memory of only about six months? They only remember the past six months of the past events, and so they can't even evaluate what should be done. What if they don't even know who their leaders are? It's not likely that they're going to make good choices, and so when they vote, they're likely to make bad choices, and all of us will have to suffer the consequences. 
So I have here a picture of my in-laws. Uh, I call them Grand Grand and Pop Pop. That's what my children call them. And they're really wonderful people. They're better people than I am. They're elders in their church. They give substantial portions of their money, of their income to charity every year. They, uh, they're always trying to help other people in various ways. So overall, they're wonderful people. They've done a lot for me personally. But the way that I'm going to repay them for that is to use them as an example right now in this talk. <laughs> Um, see, the thing is, even though Grand Grand and Pop Pop are wonderful, when they start participating in politics, a second nature comes out. They go from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde. So they might do things as follows. They're committed Democrats. And if they discover that you are a Republican, um, they won't be your friend. They don't like you. If you talk to them about political ideas and you disagree with them, they re react by getting really mad at you, telling you that you're a shill for various evil people, and then finally concluding that they should run into their bedrooms and sulk for the rest of the day. My mother-in-law in particular used to like to watch political television from the other side, like Fox News or a guy named Bill O'Reilly who is now no longer in the air. She would watch them in order to get mad, and then she would react by taking coat hangers and throw them at the TV screen, right? The thing is, what happens? Why did participating in politics corrupt them so much? It turns out that this kind of behavior, though maybe excessive, is not abnormal. Many people behave this way when they participate in politics. It turns out that we're not very good at politics, and politics is bad for us. The great British political theorist, economist, feminist author, John Stuart Mill, wrote a book a couple hundred years ago, in 1950, uh, 1850, to hypothesize about what would happen if we get people to participate more in government. What would happen if we get people to become political? His hypothesis was that to get average people to start working in politics would ennoble and enlighten them. It would make them smarter, it would make them sharper, because it would be like getting a factory worker in Manchester, England, to discover that there's more to the world. It would be like getting a fish to discover that there's a world outside of the ocean. So that was his hypothesis, but he didn't have the data to back it up. He didn't know whether it was true, so was he right? In contrast, Josef Schimpeter said, something quite different. He thought that when people behave, get into politics, something bad happens to them. And they start becoming, he says, a primitive again. They reason in a way that they would recognize as infantile in the sphere of their legitimate interests. Somehow when we participate in politics, we become mean and dumb. But also Schumpeter lacked the data to prove his case. We didn't, he didn't really know. But things have changed. In the past 70 years, starting in about like the 1950s in the United States, and then with copying that kind of research elsewhere, lots of work has been done studying what voters know, how they think, what makes them tick, what's going on in their brains, and what's going on in their hearts. And the results are overall very depressing. And unfortunately, Schumpeter is right, not Mill. Schumpeter is closer to the truth. So... What's going on with voters? There's tremendous variation in how people think and how they react and what they know. Some people have an opinion about everything. Some people have hardly any opinions. Some people have very strongly held opinions and nothing could ever make them change. Many people will change their opinions after 10 minutes. You can interview them and you can ask them the same question 10 minutes later and they'll give you the opposite answer. Some people, when they find people they disagree with, think, well, you know, you and I just disagree. We can still be friends. And many people, on the other hand, think, well, you vote for the wrong party, I hate you. And there's everything in between. <laughs> Nevertheless, even though there's all this variation, you can roughly categorize citizens in major democratic countries into two major types, which I call hobbits and later hooligans. So if you've read the Lord of the Ring novels or if you've watched the films, you've encountered hobbits. They're diminutive people, they live a kind of British countryside lifestyle, and they don't care about the outside world. Even though there's a grand cosmic going on, even though there's a war between the forces of good and evil, they're not concerned about it. What they want to do is eat breakfast, eat a snack, have this thing called the 11Zs, eat another snack breakfast, eat lunch, and smoke pipes. That's what they'd like to do. And the analog of this, the analogy in democratic politics, would be the typical citizen who chooses not to vote in a modern democracy. When we look at the people who stay home on election day, this is what we find. They don't care. That's why they stay home. They don't find politics interesting. It's just not their hobby. It doesn't grip them. They think it's boring. They also know very little. They have very little information about politics. If you ask them questions about what's happening, they don't know any of the answers. They have very few opinions about politics. They don't really have a strong ideology. They don't really know, have any, like think anything. Um, and whatever opinions they do have are very infirm and can change very quickly. So they kind of are passive and don't particularly care. All right, fair enough. 
What about the people who participate? Right? What are they like? So uh, I remember going to a football game in Brazil. It was the Sao Paulo state team versus the Sao Paulo city team. And there the fans were so enthusiastic about their teams that they couldn't sit together in the stadium. They had to separate them with, armed bar with barriers and armed policemen and keep them about 50 meters apart because they thought they would fight. And my concierge in my hotel told me I had to wear the color gray or otherwise I might get into a fight on the street. And I actually did see lots of fights on the street. There, the team, fans of those two teams hate each other and are willing to punch each other over it. What if it turns out that we're like that when it comes to politics? So another thing that happens with sports fans is they're pretty well informed. They often can remember facts about games from years ago. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if I like bring up an old World Cup game that Spain was involved in that you can remember what the score was from 40 years ago. Or even if you weren't alive, then you might even have known because you read about it. So they often know a lot of facts, but they're also incredibly biased in how the facts should be interpreted. So imagine you're watching, say, you know, the Madrid football team versus the Barcelona football team, and a player falls on the ground and flops and holds his knee. Well, if he's your player, you probably think he was fouled and that's perfectly fair and someone should get a red card. If he's a player for the other team, you think he's a liar and it's ridiculous. Right? You and the fans of the other team, you're seeing exactly the same information. You don't have any privileged information, but you interpret that information in a way that flatters what you would like to believe. So what if it turns out this is what we do with regard to politics? Well, basically, that's what we do. When you look at the people who choose to vote, the biggest thing that predicts their behavior is that they actually find politics interesting. They're fans of politics. However, they are not dispassionate thinkers. They purposely look for news sources that reinforce what they already believe and would like to believe. Oh, disconfirming evidence? How boring. I don't want to read that. Oh, disconfirming evidence? Whoever wrote this is probably a liar. Fake news. I don't need to read that. Oh, something that says I was right? I'd like to subscribe to your newsletter. That's how people behave. They watch things that tell them they were right. Not only do they do that, they often only associate with people who have the same politics. So I wouldn't be surprised if many of you, most of your friends, share your political views. It didn't always used to be the case, but now around the world in modern democracies, you find not only do people only date and make friends with people that share their politics, but they'll purposefully choose to live in an area where they know that their political view will be dominant. They're purposely segregating themselves from everybody else. And then how do they react to people with whom they disagree? We know they already don't want to live among them. So if we ask them, we say, all right, you know, uh, you vote for, I'm not sure which party you vote for, but let's say the People's Party. You vote for the People's Party. What do you think about people who vote for the socialists? What's, what's your view about them? The most common reaction you get is, oh, well, I can explain them. They're stupid and they're evil. That's why they vote that way. So hooligans are extremely biased team players and they care about winning. They don't necessarily care about the truth. In the book, I bring up another group I call Vulcans. If you've ever seen Star Trek, you know that, you know, Mr. Spock, I think, see if I can do it. Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of pictures of me in Germany doing this for some reason. Um, Mr. Spock is a perfectly rational being. He thinks scientifically. He only believes things as strongly as the evidence permits him to believe. And if you show him he's wrong, his reaction is, thank you for correcting my error. How often have you had a conversation with somebody about politics and they said, oh, thank you for showing that I'm wrong? That hasn't happened to me yet. Uh, so I bring them up not because I think I'm a Vulcan, not because I think Vulcans should rule, but because when you read what philosophers and also your school teachers and the average person in democracy say about democracy, they have kind of Vulcans in mind. What they're picturing is people who, you know, are reasonable and rational. And they're imagining that when we come and deliberate and talk with one another, that this is going to make us smarter and better. But we are not Vulcans. We are hobbits and hooligans. Democracy is the rule of hobbits and hooligans. Actually, every political system is the rule of hobbits and hooligans. That's what we have to work with. So the question is, what do we do about it? Now, why are people like this? Why are they so bad? Why is it that they're either overwhelmingly ignorant or when they're informed, they're incredibly biased and mean? Why don't we just have these kind of reasonable, open-minded people? Well, the problem isn't that we're vicious. It's not that we're mean. It's not that we're stupid. It's incentives. The problem is the incentive structure that is built into democracy. It's a flaw that we cannot easily eradicate. So what happens is, um, imagine I'm about to cross the street. What do I do? I look both ways. Not because, I think, not because I'm interested in traffic for its own sake, not because I'm hoping to you know, catch a glimpse of a cool Ferrari. It's because I need to know what's happening on the street or really bad things might happen to me. 
Now, suppose I look and I see a car zipping towards me at, say, you know, 100 kilometers an hour, and a thought occurs to me. That's not a normal automobile. That's Optimus Prime, my childhood hero from the Transformers, and he's coming to take me on an adventure to fight our arch enemy Megatron. Well, I wouldn't likely to indulge that fantasy on the street, because if I'm wrong about that, what happens? Right? I die. So, and I, I used to be an insurance adjuster, so I can tell you some people do make that mistake. So when I'm looking both ways, I'm going to be very careful about how I think about this information because I will suffer the consequences of being wrong. What about when with regard to voting? Well, unfortunately, you do not suffer the consequences for being wrong and you will not be rewarded for being right, ever. It will never happen. Your vote doesn't matter and my vote doesn't matter. All the people in this room as a, as a collective your votes don't matter. What matters is what the majority does. Individual votes make a difference only if they make a difference. Um, and your vote will only make a difference if there's a tie, right? Because you have a proportional voting system that's not quite true of you in Spain, it's true of me in the United States. So your vote has a little bit more influence than mine. But nevertheless, the chances that your vote would make a difference are vanishingly small. Um, and it depends on exactly where you live and what voting system you have. But in general, it's quite low. So I'll give you an illustration for me. I want you to imagine, because I actually ran the calculation. In 2008, then-candidate Obama calls me on the phone and says, hey, Jason, if I win, I promise to pay you $10 million out of the US Treasury. So he's not offering me $10 million to vote for him, which I could be bought, I'd do it for that much. But uh, he's offering me $10 million if he wins. So it would now be really wonderful for me if he wins. Does it make sense for me to vote for him, though? No, not really. I actually have a higher chance of dying in a car crash on the way to the voting booth than I do of casting a vote that decides that election. So that $10 million, it's like a lottery ticket. When you win the lottery, it's worth a lot, but an individual lottery ticket is worth nothing. That's what your vote is. The problem, though, is that's true of all of us. And so we have very weak incentives to learn about politics, to retain that information, or if we do study politics, to think about it in a clear-headed, rational way. Let me give you another illustration. Have you ever been in a, in a university classroom with a large number of students, say 100 or more? All right, I want you to imagine that you're in that classroom right now, and I am your lecturer, I'm your professor, and I say to you the following. I'm an egalitarian, I believe everyone should be equal, so what I want to do is give you all the same grade. 13 weeks from now, there's going to be a final exam, which will be worth 100% of your grade. And I'm going to average all the grades together, and you'll all get the same grade. That's my deal. Now, how hard would you study? You're like, eh, not very much. It doesn't make sense to study that hard because with that kind of incentive, if you work your butt off, if you spend hours hitting the books and really learning the material, and then you take that test on the final day, your grade will fail. You'll get a failing grade. And if you slack off and party and hang out and do whatever else you like to do, whatever your hobbies are instead and learn nothing, you will get a failing grade. No matter what you do, this you'll get the same grade. Since that's true of everybody, you can expect the average grade in the class to be failing. You can expect people not to learn anything. In fact, people have done this as an experiment and that's what happens. That's what's going on in a democracy. It's a final exam held every three to five years, depending on where you live, where instead of having 100 or 200 students with you in a class, you have millions of people voting at the same time, none of whom have an incentive to be informed. So the reason that people are ignorant, the reason they're irrational when it comes to politics is because democracy incentivizes them to act that way. It's built into the system. It's not easily eradicated. So this gets us to, well, what do we know about voters? How do they behave in light of these bad incentives? Well, to summarize it, voters are nice, but ignorant and irrational. What I mean by that is, you know, when you ask most people about what they think about voters, they think the following. They think, I'm nice and I vote for justice. The rest of you are mean and you vote to protect your pocketbooks. You vote for your own money. You're right about yourself and you're kind of wrong about everybody else. In fact, people are not very selfish with their voting behavior. Um, the young are not more likely to say vote against old age pensions than the old. Uh, men are not, say, more in favor of abortion rights than women in most countries. Uh, what else? Uh, um, the poor are not particularly more in favor of uh, redistribution rights than the rich. It's all roughly about the same. And that's weird because people are overwhelmingly selfish. Like to illustrate, most of you could take, have a lot of extra income and you could take that income and instead of buying luxury goods and jewelry and fancy computers or, you know, I don't know, flying me here to, from the United States at great expense, we could take that money and we could use it to save lives. We could save a lot of lives for a very little amount of money and we don't. Why not? Because we don't care that much. 
So why would we be so nice when it comes to voting? Well, the reason is because it doesn't make sense to be a selfish voter, right? Because your vote doesn't matter, you don't get any payoff for voting selfishly. I mean, to just illustrate this, imagine you are Jewish in Germany in 1932 during the fourth federal election, right? It's a disaster for you if the Nazis win. However, voting for them is not a disaster. You might as well vote for them. It won't make any, it won't make any difference. Voting for them, voting against them, and staying home have exactly the same effect. So it doesn't make sense to vote selfishly. If I want to serve my self-interest on election day, then what I should do is stay home and watch really cool TV shows or go drink in a bar. That would be serving my self-interest. So when people vote, they vote to express to other people their fidelity to the noble and to the good. A lot of voting behavior is about impressing your friends. It's about trying to convince them you're a nice person or to convince yourself you're a nice person, which means voting is largely cheap altruism. I get to consume the warm glow without costing myself anything. And that's why so much voting behavior is about just kind of, you know, not well thought out things, but things that just sound good. Right? Things that sound good. That's why we vote for that stuff. Nevertheless, we're highly uninformed and highly irrational. So why is that? Well, around the world, we've been studying what voters know and how they process that information. And we can say quite a few things. Now, for what it's worth, there's good data about many countries, but we don't really have that kind of data about Spain. For whatever reason, the sorts of data collection agencies we have, say in Canada or the US, or even in like Germany or the UK, just don't seem to exist here. So I have to kind of, I don't know, maybe Spain is the exception to the rule. Right? But in the other countries that we have data on, you find pretty uniform things, which is this. The, most people know nothing. The typical voter knows basically nothing about politics. The voter right in the middle of the distribution of knowledge knows basically nothing about politics. The average voter knows nothing about politics. But variance is high. Some people know a great deal. Most people know basically nothing. And many people know less than nothing. They're actually worse than ignorant. So as an illustration of this, every two years in the United States, something's conducted called the American National Election Study. Some of my neighbors actually work on this. They go around and survey lots and lots of voters, and they ask them many different questions, including giving them a quiz of very basic political knowledge, asking them questions such as, uh, can you find certain countries on a map? Right? Do you know which party controls the US Congress? Um, are you aware of various bills that have been passed in the past few years? Can you identify who your representative is or what party your representative works for? This is what they find. When they give people this quiz, let's say the top 25% of voters, they get about 90% of the questions right. Not brilliant, but they know some stuff. Now, granted, we're not asking them hard questions. We're not asking them to like draw supply and demand curves and explain what a tariff does to a country. They don't, we're not asking them that. We're asking them, hey, who's the vice president? But they get about 90% of those questions right. Now, the middle 50%, when you ask them this, they get about a quarter of the questions right, which is not so good because it's a multiple choice test with four answers. So, you know, easier coding. So we don't know whether they know one out of four questions or it's just random guessing. The people in the very worst, sorry to make you in the back the ignorant ones, they do worse than average. They do worse than chance. They get fewer than 25% of the questions right. So we ask them questions such as, which party tends to be more conservative, the Democrats, the Republicans? And they very confidently answer over and over again, no, you know, the Democrats are more conservative. They don't know what they're talking about. In the year 2000, during the, the very highly contested Bush, Bush the second versus Gore election, um, they asked citizens in the survey, who's more liberal? Liberal not in the European sense of liberal, the good sense of liberal, but liberal in the American sense, which just means to the left of the average guy. Um, who's more liberal, uh, Gore or Bush? A whopping 57% of voters that year got the answer right. But when we follow up with other questions, such as, okay, so you know Gore is more liberal. Who's more in favor of expanding the welfare state? They don't know the answer. Who's more in favor of rights for blacks or gays? They don't know the answer. Who's more in favor of protecting the environment? They don't know. Which one is more in favor of abortion rights for women? They don't know. So in a sense, what happened was they know that there's this word, and it attaches to Al Gore and not George Bush. And remember, only about half of them knew that. And then you're like, well, what does that word mean? And they're like, I don't know. Right? So this matters, like some people know a lot, most people know nothing, and some people know significantly less than nothing. And by the way, that's the people that show up. The people that stay home, if you ask them those same questions, they do worse, All right? So if you wonder about, should we increase participation, you should keep in mind, the people who are at home know even less than the people who are at the polls. So one question is, does it make a difference? 
who would, if, if knowledge had no effect on the way that we vote, it wouldn't really matter. But it turns out it makes a big difference. In fact, in a lot of different cases. Here's an example. Um, you know, up until my great lead, you know, our great leader, Donald Trump, fixed things with uh, Kim, like today, right? Like he fixed it today. But before he solved all the world's problems today, we had this question about what we should do about North Korea. So they go and ask Americans this last year. And some Americans are like, damn, we should nuke them. And other Americans are like, we should invade. And some say, we should try to find some sort of diplomatic solution. It turns out that the people who are the most pugilistic, the most wanted to go to war with North Korea, were also the ones that can't find it on a map. If, if we just ask people, here's a map of the world, show me where North Korea was, the ability to put the pin in the right place, or even kind of close to it, strongly tracked being against war. Right? That seems to be at least maybe some evidence that it has something to do with knowledge. Or take Brexit. Uh, Brexit was, I don't think Brexit's a good idea. I think it's bad for the UK. I think it's bad for Europeans. I think it's bad even for me, um, except for the fact that thanks to Brexit, this book got translated 10 times and I made a lot of extra money. So thank you, England, for your bad decisions. Um, what's going on with Brexit, right? Uh, this is another nice example. During the, after, both before and during the Brexit vote, a polling firm named Ipsos Mori interviewed people about what they know. And they'd ask them questions about the relationship the UK has with the European Union. One of the questions they asked them was, uh, let's, for the sake of argument, all of you in the back, you will be my leave voters and you will be my remain voters. So they ask, okay, remain voters, um, what percent of foreign investment in the UK comes from the European Union? And they say, a really a low number, and then they, but you know, they say about 20%. The truth is about 50. The people in the back are like, what percent, you leave voters, what percent comes from the uh, European Union? They're like, I don't know, 2%. So again, the closer you were to the truth, the more likely you were to vote remain. They asked some questions about how much money does the UK spend um, for certain kinds of uh, welfare programs that go to other countries. The remain voters overestimated that number by a factor of 400. The leave voters, sorry, so the leave voters did that. The remain voters estimate, overestimated by a factor of about 40. They asked some questions about uh, what percent of the UK is made up of European immigrants. Well, the leave voters think the UK is just swimming in European immigrants. 20% of the country are European immigrants. The remain voters think it's about 10%. The truth is about five. So again, for, there were a large number of questions like this. And if you were able to get the questions right, or the closer you were to the truth, the more likely you were to say the country should remain. And even if you were to statistically control for people's income and other factors, you still find that. Um, in general, when you do, and we want to know how does people's voting behavior, how does people's knowledge affect what they believe? One way to do that is to take things like the American National Election Studies. During these studies, they ask people three basic questions. Who are you? What do you know? And what do you want? We get information about their demographics, about what their gender is, what their race is, how much money they make, where they live, their employment status. These are all things that affect people's voting behavior. We also give them a quiz, again, of very basic political knowledge. Again, most people don't know the answers. And finally, we ask them about their political preferences. When we have those three sets of data, we can then calculate what information does to people's policy preferences. A priori, we don't really know. It could be that information has no effect. It could be that it causes a divergence in people's attitudes, or it could instead be that it leads to a convergence. Interestingly, this is what you find. In most countries, as people become more informed, regardless of their background demographic characteristics, they favor less overall government intervention and control of the economy. They become more economically liberal. It's not to say they become hardcore liberals at the end, but they become significantly more liberal. As they become more informed, they tend to be more strongly in favor of equality and rights for homosexuals. Even if they don't like it, they don't care. Um, they tend to be in favor of increasing taxes to offset deficits rather than just to say, do cut, cutting all the taxes. They tend to be less punitive when it comes to crime. Right? They tend to be less hawkish on foreign policy and more in favor of increasing immigration. This is a fairly universal trend that you find in a lot of different countries. Information makes people think this way, even if you control for their background factors. So that's information. What about the way that we think? Well, it turns out that in politics, we are beset by a wide range of biases that prevent us from being Vulcans. Right? It's not just that we're uninformed, so we don't think clearly. So a good way of thinking about this is that 
most people want to believe certain things. They are, we engage in what we call motivated reasoning. They have preferences over their beliefs, and their brain tries to converge upon things that make them feel good about themselves or make them feel good about their ideology. The most common way this occurs has to do with how we consume news, right? Uh, what happens is I look for news sources that verify what I already believe, and I avoid news sources that disconfirm my views. If you show me something that, like if you were to give me a study and I'm a typical voter that says that I'm wrong, my immediate reaction is whoever did this study is probably a liar, and they were probably paid to say that, right? Uh, my mother-in-law, one time I told her about a study uh, with regard to campaign finance, and her reaction was something like, ah, these guys have to be a bunch of Republican shills. And they weren't. They're Democrats, but that's her reaction. We're also affected by things like something called availability bias. How easily can I remember certain facts? So people often think, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the books that you published, Progresso, was about how the world is wonderful right now. This is like the best time to be alive. There's so few people in poverty, the smallest percentage of people in, around the world in poverty there ever has been. People are richer than they ever were. Things are getting so much better. And nevertheless, people think things are getting worse. Why? Well, when you turn on the news, it only tells you sad stories. If you can easily remember these sad and negative stories, and so it creates the impression that things are bad, right? In fact, in the United States, we had a year where everyone was really paranoid about kidnapping because the media realized if they put a kidnapping story on the news, everyone would watch it. So there became a widespread false belief that we we're having an epidemic of kidnapping. As a matter of fact, this is what had been happening for kidnapping rates the whole time. They've just been dropping. Right? False impressions. We're affected by things like peer pressure. We're affected by the framing of questions. We don't even know what the people want half the time because it turns out that I can ask you the same question two different ways and you'll give completely different answers. You can say things like, should we increase welfare spending? No. Should we increase social insurance spending? Yes. It's the same thing. It would be like saying, should we buy a couch? No. 80% of people, no. Okay, should we buy a sofa? Yes. It's a synonym. means exactly the same thing. We get different answers. So what do the people even want? We don't even really know sometimes. So people think, oh, there's an obvious solution to this. It's not just about having people vote. What we need to do is get them together in a room to talk with one another because that will solve all of our problems. What they're picturing, though, is when Vulcans talk to one another, they learn from one another. You know something, I know something, and we split the difference and we figure out we learn more. What about, you know, hooligans? If you think if I got um, all the Barcelona football team favorite fans and all the Madrid football team fans and put them in a room and had them really deliberate which team is better, that they'd come to some sort of consensus, figure out the truth, what do you think would happen? They'd probably punch each other, right? Well, it turns out when we do that with uh, citizens when it comes to politics, that's effectively what happens too. If you put people who belong to different political parties in a room to deliberate, the most common thing they do is avoid talking about the issues that are contentious because they don't want to have a fight. The second most common thing they do is if you force them to talk, they polarize even more. You know, they start off this far apart, and after talking, they become even further or farther apart, and they get really mad at each other. So we have this desire that deliberation will solve all of our problems, but it doesn't. It's more of a kind of drunken college party. I don't think that these facts are just sort of depressing. I think that there's actually a kind of injustice that takes place in democracy. I think that if you're going to wield power over another person, you have an obligation to use that power competently and in good faith. So to illustrate that, uh, let's suppose for the sake of argument, you've been accused of capital murder. You've been accused of premeditated murder, and we are your jury. So during the trial, the prosecutor gives up and gives you a bunch of information. Um, the defense gives up and gives a bunch of information. And then we're asked to go back and deliberate about whether you're guilty. But, you know, it turns out we were really bored by it, so we spent the whole time looking at pictures of cats on our iPhones. And then we flip a coin and we say, okay, you're guilty. No, we have no information. We haven't learned anything, but we call you guilty anyways. We've destroyed your life, but for no good reason. And you would think that that was an unjust decision. Or suppose instead we find you guilty because we just don't like you. Like, we're just, we don't like people like you, so we find you guilty for that reason. Or suppose we believe irrationally that you're an alien from outer space trying to take over the world, and this is a way to get you. Or suppose that we find you guilty because you own a rival bagel shop and we want to put you out of business so our business will do better. In all four of those cases, when we're ignorant, when we're malicious, when we're irrational, whether we're being selfish, we would think that it's unjust for it to behave this way. Well, why is that? The reason is because 
in a criminal case, the people who are making the decision wield tremendous power over you. They can deprive you of liberty. They can ruin your life. In some places, they can even kill you for, for making this decision. We would think that they're charged with instituting justice, with making just decisions. So we think they owe it to you and really to the rest of us to make this decision competently and in good faith. But if that applies to participants in a criminal trial, I think it applies beyond that. I think it applies to everything that, you know, parliament members do, everything that uh, executives do, everything that bureaucrats do. Because when they're making big decisions, high stakes decisions, they can deprive citizens of life, of liberty, and greatly affect their life prospects for the worse. But I also think it applies even to voters. You know, so there's a story that people tell when it comes to voting where they say, it's okay for us to make stupid decisions because we're just hurting ourselves. It's not really true. All right, there's one thing like, your relationship with democracy is not a consensual relationship. It's not like you entered into a social contract and chose to be in a democracy. It's just something that kind of happened to you because you were born in a certain place for the most part. Further, even if you strongly dissent, there's no way of getting out of the rules. But there are also lots of people who are affected by these decisions who have no say. So it's foreigners and immigrants and other people, children, have to live with it. So one of the big complaints about Brexit is old people voted for the UK to leave and then they're going to die and young people will have to suffer the consequences. But it's also even just people outside of it. So this isn't true of every country, but like when my country makes decisions about who our president is going to be, that has a big effect on who gets blown up next year, right? And other kinds of things because we wield a lot of power and we don't do it very responsibly. So it's not just us choosing for ourselves. It's not the same thing as like, if you decide to eat like too much sugar for the next 10 years, you'll get diabetes, but you're just hurting you. It's hurting everybody. And so politics is a matter of justice. It's not like personal choices. Um, I have here a picture of John Adams, a former US president. John Adams, not a good guy. I don't like him. And I'm not one to usually quote US presidents because I don't really like any of them. But I really like this quotation by him. He says, I must study politics and war so that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, history, and architecture, and so on, so that their children can have a right to study painting, poetry, music, statuary, tapestry, and other fine and beautiful things. John Adams was a political animal, if ever there was one, but he thought we should evolve into a higher form of life, a higher life form of life where politics is minimized, where the space of politics in our lives is much smaller. I think he's right about that. Politics is bad at, for us, and we're bad at it. So I'm going to end with a couple of them, a few thoughts. One is about speculating about the nature, the kind of value that, um, philosophy, or that um, democracy has. Actually, you know what? You both covered this, so I'm going to skip right over instead. All right, I'm going to end by talking about some possible alternatives to democracy. All right, what should we do? Is there anything we can do besides having straight democracy? There are a number of different ideas out there, and I'll tell you about one. Uh, it's called epistocracy. What epistocracies have in common is that in one way or another, they weigh votes according to knowledge. Now, the crudest form of it, which is not the form I advocate, but the one that everyone likes to talk about, would be... You only get to vote if you can prove you're competent. So you have to take a test and you get a license to vote in the same way that you get a driver's license. I'm open to that idea, I have to admit. I don't think it would be as bad as it sounds at first glance, but that's not the view that I'm actually advocating. What I advocate instead is something called, I call government by simulated oracle. The idea here is, uh, just as if you only had you know, a wise person you could consult for the answers, wouldn't that be great? Well, what if we could somehow create that? The way we would do it is by using a method that political scientists have already been using to figure out how information affects our policy preferences. What you do is on election day, everyone gets to vote, including you know children, let, let toddlers vote. It doesn't really matter. Let everyone vote. But when they vote, we do three things. The first thing is we anonymously collect their demographic information. We find out who they are. That way we can test to see how you know, things like race and income affect the way that we're voting and correct for any unfairness that might be there. So this would actually already be more fair than what happens in modern democracies. The second thing we do is we give people a quiz of basic political knowledge. We find out what they know. The third thing we do is we ask them what they want, which party they support, how they want to go on a particular referendum, which part person they want to be uh, the representative, et cetera, et cetera. When we have, again, these three sets of information, we can then statistically calculate what the public would want if only it were fully informed. 
And the idea is we do that instead of what the uninformed public wants. So this is a way of letting everyone participate equally in, in the system and extracting the knowledge that they have and coming up with an estimation of what would we have chosen if only we knew what we were talking about. And it doesn't give particularly more power to one group over another. It doesn't really disenfranchise anybody, but it extracts knowledge from the people better than actual democracy does. In a sense, we're asking, what an enlightened public would want rather than what the actual unenlightened public wants. And I think this is something worth trying. So, you know, Winston Churchill famously said, people love to give me this quotation, so I'm going to give it to you instead. Because when they, when they tell me this quotation, they never say the whole thing. They leave off the last line. He says, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. You know, usually people say, except for all the others, it's not the entire quotation. The actual quotation is that have been tried from time to time. I think he's right. At the end of the day, I'm a fan of democracy. I'm also a fan of the British heavy metal band Iron Maiden, but many of their albums are terrible, right? Democracy overall is maybe the best system we've had. You know, in general, democracies are the best places to live. In general, they do a better job protecting people's rights than other forms of government. But nevertheless, just like Iron Maiden, they have some flaws. And if we know what those flaws are and what's causing them, maybe it's worth experimenting with ways of correcting them. Because a lot is at stake. You know, whether people live or die, whether they remain in poverty or prosperity, whether injustice is done or not done, is determined by a large part by how we vote. So we need to do something better than what we're currently doing. Um, with that, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take your comments and questions. Who would like to start? Okay, um, uh, well, good afternoon, Mr. Brennan. Uh, first thing, uh, thank you for this lecture. Your lecture and your book, it was <laughs> absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, uh, there's something I would like to ask about your opinion. So you claim that uh, inform uh, the more informed the public is, the, the more likely they are to have certain political beliefs, right? Like free trade and all of that. Also, um, the more earnings they have, the more likely they are to have these political beliefs. So we can tie information with earnings because if you have money, you can afford a good education and all that. So what I want to ask is, in your opinion, uh, could those political beliefs be also tied to their greater earnings in a way that like people who have more earnings tend to be more tend to have more information but those who have no earnings or less earnings are more vulnerable to change like for example um, if you have earnings you tend to be like uh, pro uh, immigration right but people who has no earnings uh, they might be more more vulnerable to the effects of immigration even if they have the information to understand that that's uh, like overall benefit. And secondly, do you believe that vulnerability, if, if, if it exists, is real or is it just perceived? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's a really excellent question. Um, and so I went back to the slide because I'd like to like sort of explain how it deals with that very problem. It is true that when we look at certain people, we find certain things like, uh, you know, Let's take people who favor, say, free trade. We might wonder, well, why do they favor free trade? Is it because they know economics? Is it because they're better informed? Is it because they're richer? Is it because they're, they belong to a certain race or something like that? It's hard to know that just by looking at raw data. But the nice thing is, if you take a couple statistics classes, it really doesn't take that many, and you have the right kinds of surveys, you can then find out how certain things affect people. So it turns out that when you look at race, say, as an independent variable, when you correct for the influence of everything else, it has very little effect on people's attitudes towards trade. In this particular slide, what they've done here um, with these kinds of studies is they've already statistically corrected for the influence of race, income, uh, gender, where people live in the country, and so on. So this is meant to say information by itself, when we correct for the influence of all these other factors, this is what it does to us. Um, so yes, you're right that normally if you just ask people their opinion, you don't know why they think it. But if we get enough people in the room and we get all this together, we can find how information affects their policy preferences while eliminating the influence of other factors. It's just like what happens in medicine and other fields. If we, uh, if we want to know, just taking certain vitamins, like suppose we had the thing like uh, all of you run five miles a day and the rest of you are sedentary. Sorry, five, I'll make it, you know. 
uh, six, seven point eight kilometers. Uh, you all run a bunch of kilometers per day, and in the back, you're sedentary. You take vitamins, and they don't. And then it turns out you're healthier than they are in a certain way. We want to know, well, you know, or that some of them take vitamins, and some of them do. We want to know, well, what to what degree is does it turn out that the vitamins are doing the work, and to what degree is that the running? Well, the way that we do that is we kind of collect data about the few of you in the back who um, are taking the vitamins and the people up here, and then using statistics, we can eliminate the influence of running to just look purely at the influence of vitamins. So this is something that's used widely in the social sciences, and this slide is telling you what it does. So yeah, it's a really good question, but yeah, information independently correcting for all these other factors makes people more liberal overall. Thank you for your lecture. <clears throat> when I first read about your proposal of uh, epistocracy, I thought it was a terrible idea. But um, Juan Ramon Rayo uh, the other day uh, put an example uh, about something that I think that is really very similar to what you propose, and it is the administration of justice. Penal uh, justice is a very sensitive issue and it affects really very much other people's rights. And uh, we never vote for the people who administer this justice, at least in Spain. Uh, we just uh, make a kind of epistocracy. There are very tough exams, and only people who, are, who have demonstrated their ability uh, are entitled to administer this important uh, issue. So what do you think about about it? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that question because it, it turns out uh, a friend of mine, Chris Sopranant, and I are actually now writing a book on the American criminal justice system and what's wrong with it. And it's directly in relation to this particular thing. Uh, you're right. In most criminal justice systems, in order to participate, to be a judge, to be a prosecutor, to be a defense attorney, you need to be well-educated. You need to prove, not just educated, the education isn't enough. You need to prove you know what you're talking about. Why? Because we think this is host, so high stakes, we're not going to just let anyone be involved. Um, we do have, in some countries, jury systems. I actually don't remember whether you juries here. I forgot about that. Sorry about that. I actually had to study Spanish uh, politics quite a bit in college, but again, I've forgotten some of it. Um, but we let juries participate, but they have to pay attention and they have to prove that they're not biased, right? But you know what? In the US, we do something really dumb. We have lots of voting for who the prosecutors will be and who the district attorneys will be. So we don't have them appointed. We use a democratic system to pick the people who will actually participate. And there's really good evidence, not written by people like me who are democratic skeptics, but written by a lot of the pro-democracy people, that this is part of the reason why we have such a highly punitive system. You know, so in the US, you know, we call ourselves in the land of the free. We're not. Um, we have more prisoners, as far as we know, than China does. Right. That's really embarrassing. That's, it's evil. It's not just embarrassing. It's evil. Why do we do it? There's a lot of factors at play, but one of the main things driving it is that we vote for the defense attorneys. We vote for the prosecutors. And the way that they win power is by getting up in front of voters, lying to them, and scaring them with false statistics about crime. They go, oh, I'm really scared, and they vote for the meanest, most punitive person who then imposes really harsh punishments on everybody and ruins a bunch of lives, mostly of black people, by the way. Right? So yeah, I think the criminal justice system is a really good example of cases where epistocracy matters a lot. And when you look at the flaws that are happening in the American criminal justice system, there's very good evidence that the reason it's so bad is because we're much more democratic about it than, say, the UK or Spain or Germany. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk. And I have two questions. Sure. First um, is, well, the thing that we see nowadays um, also regarding to the hooligan effect of how people are so passionate and so and takes um, political conflict so personally is that in most democratic scenarios or countries, people think of politics as part of their identity. So I'd like to ask, um, in your opinion, how did politics become such an important part of an individual's um, identity. For um, I come from China, and for us, I guess politics is not, um, I mean, we, we are informed, and a lot of people are interested in politics, and we talk about the policies and everything, but we don't consider it as part of our um, identity in a lot of cases. 
Um, so that's my first question. And my second question is, like this slide is um, showing, that knowledge affects policy preferences. Um, but um, the portals or the source of knowledge or information about politics that we have nowadays is mostly from the news media, from the TV channels, from the radio and newspaper. Um, which, in a way, they are good sources of information, but at the same time, they're probably the culprit of picturing or depicting politics as sport events or even entertainment. So, with this as the general backdrop, um, how can the average person actually break out of this hobbit hooligan dichotomy that we face with? That, thank you. Great. Um, I'm actually going to interpret that as three questions. You asked two, but I'm going to interpret it as three. So. Uh, I'll start with a question about maybe to what extent is the media to blame for this? Um, I think a very common view is that the media is not very good and it's making voters worse. And there are certain ways in which it's not. I gave you some examples. They might misrepresent how, by just by telling certain stories over and over again, um, they might make you think that certain things are happening that really aren't. But overall, I think the reason the media is bad is because we're bad. So think about the media. I, I'm, I'm a media mogul. I just want to make money selling newspapers. Well, what am I going to do? I, I got to get you to buy them. So if I think my audience is a bunch of dispassionate, truth-seeking social scientists, I'm going to write a certain kind of newspaper. If I think that they're you know, lowbrow, highly biased people who want me to fl fling mud at our enemies, I'm going to write that kind of newspaper. So the reason that the media is behaving the way it is, because that's what it takes to get most people to consume that information. That's what it takes to get you to read, to get you to watch, and to sell the advertisements. So I, don't th I think it is true that the media partially corrupts us, but I think for the most part, we corrupt the media. When you look at how bad the media goes, you're like, oh man, ooh, we're bad. Um, as far as breaking free of it, uh, my best advice of not being a hooligan is to just start reading things from the other side. Like you should be able to do pass what I call an ideological Turing test. You should be able to explain other people's points of view in a way that they find appealing. It's very hard to do this. So one of my one of my favorite books about politics um, is called Hearing the Other Side by Diana Mutz, who is a political scientist at uh, the University of Pennsylvania in the United States. She did a survey or a series of studies where she would go and ask people questions like this. She'd say, you're a committed Republican. Can you explain to me why someone would be a Democrat? The most common answer was, well, because they're stupid and evil. If that person answered that way, that predicted that person heavily participates in politics, gives money to political parties, volunteers, and votes frequently often. Some people on their hand, though, would be like, you're a committed Democrat. Can you explain to me why Republicans might think the way they do? Some of them are able to say, oh, yeah, here's what Republicans think. And they can explain it in a way that Republicans would go, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that's my view. Those people don't vote, don't participate. They stay home. It's weird. Like, the better you are, the more able you are to understand their side, the more likely you to stay home. That, that might seem weird, but, uh, you know, it makes sense if you've ever seen, like, um, uh, maybe street preachers. You don't have a lot of, like, evangelical preachers here in Europe, but you do seem to have Jehovah's Witnesses around everywhere. If you go up to them and you ask them, you know, uh, you've got material about Jehovah's Witnesses. What do you, should I read that? They're like, yes. And you're like, uh, should I read the Koran too? And they're like, no. You know, you never see people who think you should be open-minded and read the other side. So that's really what it comes down to, I think. Read contrary points of view charitably. Very few people do it. Read more stuff that you disagree with than the stuff that you agree with. Um, whatever newspaper you have, read the other side. That's what, that would really help. And have real conversations with those people's, people afterwards. The main thing you asked, though, was about identity. Um, and that is the most crucial question. I could have spent the entire thing just talking about that because it's so central. I almost left it off, but you're, you're, you're hitting something really important. If you want to summarize how democracy works in one sentence, it's that politics is not about policy. So the story that I was told when I was in you know, secondary school, when I was about you know, 13 years old, I have a teacher, not a political scientist, up in front of the classroom, and she says, here's how democracy works. People have interests. They pick policies on the basis of those interests. I care about this stuff. These are the policies that will achieve my ends. They then look at all the political parties, and they pick the political party that best matches their, the policies that they want because of their interests. Turns out, not true. Like, overwhelmingly not true. That's, that's what everyone thinks how, how democracy works. It's false. What really happens is something like this. Certain identities get attached to certain political parties for relatively arbitrary reasons, having little to do with whether that party is good for those people or good for the things that they care about. And then people who have that identity will vote for that party again and again and again, regardless of what the party stands for, with very few people changing. So an example would be something like this. 
people like me, I'm from the Boston area. I have, though I'm, you know, a mongrel, I, I sort of see myself as more Irish than anything else. So Boston Irish Catholics, what do they do? They vote Democrat, not because the Democrats are especially good for them, but because of weird stuff like arbitrary stuff that happened in the late 1800s. They used to vote Republican, now they vote Democrats. And they vote Democrat time and time again. Um, so for them, most of them, it's just, I vote in the same way that because I'm from the Boston area, I root for the New England Patriots, the Boston Red Sox, the Boston Bruits, and the Boston Celtics. Those are my sports teams, not because I carefully studied all the teams for all the sports and picked the best ones. I mean, I'm, luckily they are the best ones, but not... <laughs> Not because, like, just fortuitously for me, so this isn't the best example, but, you know, I didn't pick them out of hat. I picked them because that's what people like me do. And if I wear Red Sox gear and I wear Patriots stuff and I say that I like this thing, then when I'm in my home area, people are more likely to be my friend and buy me a beer and hang out with me or date me or do business with me, right? And part of what it is to be a Red Sox fan is hating the New York teams. So if somebody's like, if you're like a New York Yankees fan, then I'm like, oh, I hate you. And you're like, I hate me. Though we don't fight like they do in, say, Brazil about this stuff. Um, so that's what happens with politics too. It's, you get arbitrarily attached to a certain thing because of your identity, and then you just vote for it over and over and over again, regardless of what they do. Most of the people who vote for those parties don't even know what the party stands for. You can lie to them. This is a real game. Like you've seen this on television, but, but this is, these are real scientific studies. You go up to them and say, hey, you're a Democrat, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, do you think it was good that the Democrats bombed Somalia yesterday? And they're like, yeah, that was great. And it's like, I just made that up. That didn't happen. Oh, they just, whatever you tell them the Democrats do, they think it's good because they're a Democrat. The one upshot of this, this is why I think what I'm saying is actually kind of nice rather than mean. It sounds really mean, like I'm really mean to voters, but there's something kind of nice about it. What it means is that when you have, say, I don't know, 40% of Americans voting for a loudmouth, golden haired clown who is racist and kind of semi fascistic, it doesn't mean they really support him. They're voting for him because he's the Republican, right? And they just claim that they support his stuff now because that's their team. In the same way that whatever the Red Sox do, I'm going to support the Red Sox. They're supporting him because he's a Republican. It's not because they genuinely identify with him. Um, when you see the five-star movement in Italy, when you see uh, you know some other kinds of movements like that in like the AFD, perhaps in Germany, it's not because they're necessarily really de identifying with that group. It might just be that, or with the policies, it's just that that's the group that their cohort belongs to. So, thank you. Really good question. Uh, isn't it uh, irony that the only way we have to change democracy? is with the democracy's rules. Uh, in any case, if the people had the opportunity to vote or to decide this, will be the decision right? Because it's made by people who don't know about it. Yeah, good. Uh, so, you know, one, there might be questions and I, that about even we should go even more radical than this. Um, and a lot of the reasons I don't maybe propose even more radical ideas is because, because I'm kind of taking it for granted that we're going to do things like have a state and have states that do certain things. I'm not even looking into that. Um, so all of the kind of things I'm proposing are, are versions of trying to fix the system without destroying it, even though I have to admit I'm somewhat uh, amenable to destroying it. But that's, that's a different book. Uh, so one thought is, and this relates to your question is, all right, let's say we do what I propose. We have a new kind of election where you don't just vote, but you tell us who you are, you tell us what you know, and you vote. And then we use that to figure out what the enlightened public would have wanted. And we do that. Government by simulated oracle. A good question is, who decides what the questions are on the test? I mean, if you let me decide, it'll be wonderful and justice will happen, but you're not going to, I won't be put in charge of it. It'll be the worry is it'll be the kinds of people that I live near. You know, some of my neighbors are, are lobbyists. They're going to try to make sure that the questions are posed in such a way to generate the outcomes they want. Some of my neighbors are um, uh, bureaucrats. They're going to do the same thing. One of my neighbors is my U.S. Congress person. He's going to make sure he's a Democrat. He's going to make sure that the questions are written in such a way that it uh, helps the Democratic Party and hurts the Republicans. So the problem is the test itself is going to be abused for the sake of special interests. So how can we protect against that? So this might sound paradoxical, but this is my, I think, the best thing to do. We let the people decide what goes on the test. Before, let's say six months before an election, um, we take 500 citizens selected at random, and we tell them, your job, you're going to get paid to do this, will be to decide what will be on the voter, the exam part of the voting 
uh, what will be uh, in the quiz that we're using during election day. You have to decide what kinds of information citizens should know. By the way, we're not going to reveal this to people ahead of time. It's gonna be secret. So they'll just have to study a lot. And that might sound weird because you might think, if they're so uninformed, how could they possibly know what should go on the test? But almost paradoxically, they do know what should go on the test. If you go up and you ask the average citizen, what are some kinds of facts you think you should know in order to vote well? This is what they'll say. Well, you should probably know what the unemployment rate is. You know what? You might maybe you should know what the price of a bus ticket is, or a gal, or you know, a liter of milk. Um, you should know who who runs Congress. You should know who's in charge and what they've been doing. They actually say the things I think they should know, but they don't know it. So it's like they know they should know these things, but they don't, right? So in a sense, asking people what does it take to be competent about democracy is a really easy question. What I do for a living piece of cake. Asking them to be actually competent is really hard. They don't have a strong incentive to do so. And if that seems weird, there are other examples like this that work too. So if I were to go up and ask my 10-year-old son, hey, what does it take to make a good marriage partner? What, what should you look for in someone that you would marry? He'd actually give a really good account of what it would take to find a good marriage partner. But he's certainly not competent to actually choose somebody right now. I mean, I wasn't even competent to do that till I was maybe 25, I hope, right? We'll, we'll see. I'll let you know at the end of my life. But I think so. So far, it looks like around then, that's when I figured it out, right? So this is very common where we sometimes, we know what we should know. We know what kinds of information we should have. But we don't have it. So I think we can actually trust the people to create the test that we then use to, in a sense, weigh um, voting behavior to choose the actual outcomes. And this will be relatively free of abuse. It won't it will mean that the test won't be sort of beholden to the special interest groups that you know my neighbors are all part of. Thank you, uh, Jason. Really interesting talk, and all your books are very interesting. Uh, but I'm going to be a bit uh, critical. Uh, might you have a philosopher's bias? Because when you propose epistocracy, you, you're proposing uh, using knowledge, and you're a knowledge worker, actually, in the uh, political philosophy uh, environment. I say this because of what is missing, what, what you don't propose, which is using also interests, what is a stake for, for voters. And that is the other system that you don't mention, which is a shareholder, shareholder voting in, a, in, a, in businesses, which already exist because epistocracy is like a kind of intellectual experiment. But we have uh, systems that already work. They're not political systems, but well, they have worked in the past because we had census or censitary suffrage. So why don't you consider what's a stake for people? Murray Rothbard and other people have said, okay, a vote expresses information, but it expresses very little information because it doesn't express how important is something for an individual. So what, what I see is a system which is incomplete, considering only knowledge, but not what's a stake, interests. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, it's a good proposal, and, and for what it's worth, there are other philosophers, um, I'm trying to think like Harry Brighouse, uh, Flower Bean, a few others who have actually argued for systems like this. And you know, Rothbard is you know a libertarian, and but there are people on the left who argue for something like this too. The the difficulty is a lot of these ideas I think are good in principle, and they're they're just difficult to figure out how would you actually implement that rule. Because with a lot of votes, we don't really know how to measure how much you have a stake in it versus me. And also there's a kind of paradox sometimes where whether you have a stake in the decision depends upon what the decision will be. You know, so we don't even know ahead of time like who it affects the most. But in principle, I'd be open to that. Nevertheless, there's still an issue in that even if you have a great stake in an outcome, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you have a strong incentive to vote well unless there are very few voters. Right? So imagine, think of like, uh, I think the election of Trump. The people who, the, the, Trump's like a nice example because Trump, it looks like he's going to be a protectionist. And after that, the election took place, um, some people hypothesize, well, the reason people voted for Trump is because they are the losers from globalization. Free trade hurts them. They know it hurts them. And so they're voting against free trade in order to help themselves. And the argument was like, they actually have a stronger stake in free trade than I do. But it turns out it's true that they have a stronger stake in it, but the effect goes the other way. Like later, some economists measure, well, how much of an income subsidy do people get from trade? It turns out people like me, I, my income is raised by maybe about 20% thanks to as much free trade as we have. But the average Trump voter, their income is going up by a factor of about 50% thanks to free trade. Up, not down, up. 
So the weird thing is, like, even though they have, like, I think if we gave them an even higher stake, um, that wouldn't necessarily make them vote well because there'd still be so many of them voting at the same time that it makes sense for you to indulge your biases and you to indulge your biases. You have to really get it to a very small number of people before people start voting in a kind of rationally self-interested way that really reflects what's at stake for them. That said, um, there's another uh, policy proposal. Um, let's see if I can get it back up. Oh, I have to switch it. Let's see. Oh, are they going to switch for me? All right. There's another policy proposal. I don't need, I don't need the slide um, that's out there called Futurearchy. Um, it's been propounded by an economist named Robin Hansen and a number of others. And the way that Futurearchy works is you get, make people have a stake by making them bet on things. You might have heard of this, but maybe some people haven't. Um, so the idea here is that when you place a bet on something, it makes you lose when you're wrong and win when you're right. Right, so suppose I say something like this. Um, during the night of the election uh, in the United States, when Donald Trump was going to win, a number of my friends got on Facebook and said apocalyptic things. World War III is going to start. So then I'd respond by saying, well, what do you mean by World War III? And they responded with things like, oh, uh, we're going to have a prolonged war with Russia, open escalated conflict, real direct conflict with Russia where people are shooting at each other. And okay, okay, that's what you mean by World War III. I'm willing to bet you $5,000 that that will not happen in the next 10 years. They didn't take the bet, right? Another person said, oh, because Trump is elected, um, abortion is going to become illegal in the United States. And they said, when? Oh, soon. Okay, well, I'll bet you $5,000 that will not happen in the next 10 years. No one took the bet. The reason is because normally when we talk, we're just expressing things and it elicits approval or disapproval. But when somebody says, do you want to bet? Now you will be rewarded if you're right and punished if you're wrong. And it shuts people up. You can try this for fun. Like do this with your friends. I think so-and-so will happen. Want to bet? 90% of the time they'll shut up. And if they do want to bet, bet him. You know, if you believe they're wrong, bet and make some money. You know, and, and that's good. So there's a way, it turns out, um, it turns out that even better than experts, polling experts about things, is what are called information markets. These used to exist. They kind of went bankrupt, or they kind of disappeared for a while thanks to U.S. intervention. We ruin everything, sorry. Uh, <laughs> thanks to U.S. intervention, in trade and a few other information markets had to disappear because they made it illegal to participate in them. Um, and now they're kind of coming back. But what they find is that markets where people bet on what will happen in the future are much better at predicting the future than anything else. They're not perfect, but they're better than asking experts and they're better than asking lay people. They work better than anything else. It turns out there is a way, uh, it's kind of complicated, I'm not gonna go through it right now, but there's a way of using betting markets to pick political policies. And the thought is we should perhaps do that as a way of choosing policy when we can. So if you wanna read a summary of this, uh, look for the following paper. It's called, Should We Vote on Values But Bet on Beliefs? Vote on values, but bet on beliefs. And honestly, I think that would work even better than epistocracy. So as much as we can do that, we should. I picked epistocracy for the book because it's the most offensive view and I wanted to be contrarian. And I want to show that even that could be defend defended. But that's the thing I would go with. And that's, I think, the best version of what you're proposing. Another? Uh, you talk about a lot about Trump and uh, and him uh, elected as president of the United States. I thought that you know United States people made a mistake at the time, and as you mentioned, it would you know influence the whole world. And today, and Kim and Trump has met, have met, and I thought that maybe you know the majority of people were wrong, but that wrongness made something great, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, you know, I, I, we don't really know what's going to happen from that, but the very fact that they met is interesting. It's clear that the status quo was not working, and the fact that Trump is the kind of person who's willing to flout convention might have some benefits. So I think he just gave up on a consensus, and he's a personality-based person, so is Kim Jong-un, and so it makes sense for him maybe to do that. So, you know, I certainly, do, I'm not of the view that everything he does is a disaster. I have a lot of friends, it's weird because I don't like Trump, but I don't want to be in the position of defending him. But when I read what my friends say about him, I'm like, he's not a very good guy, but you're still not being fair to him, right? And so I think he deserves a lot of credit for having this meeting. Um, also, this might be very speculative, but one of my economist friends said, the fact that he had it in Singapore is really interesting. 
His idea is something like, what is Singapore? It's not really democratic. Some people think it is. It's not quite democratic. It seems to be a sort of semi-authoritarian regime. That's also awesome, right? I mean, that's so good about civil liberty. It's overall a pretty awesome place, right? Um, one of the better places to live in the world and a really prosperous place. Some people think what he's doing is he's like, come to Singapore, look. Maybe you could do this instead, right? So there's a thought that maybe this is all kind of a calculated behavior. So yeah, absolutely, uh, he could turn out to be wonderful. In fact, I hope he does. I, my hope, and this is what I say about everyone who's ever elected, is that they will turn out to be the best president or congressperson or whatever we've ever had. Like, I want to be wrong. When we invaded Iraq in 2003, I said the same thing. I'm like, I'm against this war, but I hope I turn out to be wrong about that. Why? Because we're doing it. So whatever we're doing, I hope turns out for the best. But you're right, like not everything he does is a disaster. And sometimes the fact that he is an outsider or that he's willing to flout certain conventions is really useful. Um, sometimes the people that are like more popular among the elite aren't very good. You're right. Um, why not do a, uh, why did you decide that uh, to talk about um, the skills of the people who decide and not uh, the reason why these people should decide. Like, I mean, um, okay. Let, let what they decide? Like, the, uh, like the, what, we, what we were talking about before yeah. about uh, decentralization or uh, not about the skills. Um, and also uh, about the people who has uh, maybe not intellectual background, but they have the skin in the game. They are the people who is working in the area that yeah. is going to be regulated and so. Yeah, very good. Um, so one question, and a lot, sometimes people often ask me this sort of question, which is why didn't, rather than complaining about voters and trying to fix them, why not complain about other things and trying to fix that? Um, so part of what, I do have a bunch of other books complaining about those things too, for what it's worth, uh, and other articles. But part of the reason is because a lot of that stuff has been very heavily explored. Um, there are lots of books arguing, say, uh, I have a friend named Ilya Soman who wrote a somewhat similar book called The Problem of Democratic Ignorance, and, or Political Ignorance. And his reaction is, voters are dumb, and so in order to mitigate the damage that they do from being dumb, we should limit the scope of what government ought to do. And he's also a libertarian. Now. I'm, I'm classically, li I'm a liberal, like he, I'm a libertarian, liberalish kind of guy. Like I also want those results, but notice that it's very much like the way we solve the problem is by implementing my ideology. It, I, I think he's right, but it sure sounds convenient, right? So the interesting thing about my book is even though I have a particular ideology, I'm not saying something like the way to solve the problem is to implement my ideology. I'm saying, well, if we're going to have this system, here's a way of making it better. Um, so partly the books have already been written, partly I wanted to write something that was more ideologically neutral. Um, partly it was because I think people, I, I started by saying like, when you say what's wrong with democracy, everyone wants to point fingers. It's the media, it's the politicians, it's the corporations, it's the unions, it's the other special interest, it's, you know, evil foreign influence, uh, it's the Russian hackers, it's the immigrants, it's, the, but no one likes to do that. And I really, that bothers me. And I wanted to take the finger and do one of these. And also finally, you know, most of these books about democracy, they approach it with a kind of religious reverence. When they say the word democracy, for them, they hear angels going, ah, and they hear pipe music playing and a light suddenly appears from nowhere. And I think that's a mistake. I'm just like, government's at best a hammer. That's all, as you guys are saying, it's all it is. It's a tool for generating outcomes. And I really wanted to convince people of that. And I can't do it unless I, critique the people themselves. You know, I have to critique the way that we are rather than the elites. Um, the other thing that you're asking about though is uh, um, what kinds of knowledge are important? So it's really easy for me to say, and this relates to your question as well, like, uh, well, when I think of like, what do I think people ought to know? The kinds of things I'm gonna come up with happen to be the kinds of things I tend to know a lot about, or at least, you know, I sort of know about. I'll say, I think people really should know about, say, the economics of trade. Um, I think they should know about, say, monetary and fiscal policy and the studies on that. I think they should know about um, economic work on the nature of immigration and what immigrants do to the economy or do to other people. I think they should know that stuff. And I think they should know a lot of political facts that seem really obvious, like who represents them and so on. Um, and then sometimes people will say things like, yeah, but shouldn't they also know, like what also matters is knowing the price of milk and knowing how much daycare costs and knowing uh, you know, what it's like to live in your own neighborhood. 
So I think, in a sense, all of these forms of knowledge are important for decision making. Um, and I really would like everyone to have access to all of that. So hopefully these are measures which will at least improve upon that to some degree, even if they won't be perfect. Epistocracy in order to work depends crucially on some data you have presented, which I find, uh, I will accept them, but I find them a bit surprising that uh, more informed people, more knowledgeable people would would be better uh, in control, would be would take better decisions. And are you afraid of the Hayekian dangers, uh, like the fat fatal conceit and uh, that uh, these people get too much power and then they think uh, that they can plan and, and decide everything for for others. Also, there's, uh, that depends on how strong epistocracy, the, the epistocratic bias is, because how many more votes would you give to someone who is more intelligent? Because have you, have you, uh, as you have said, if we uh, apply also the shareholder idea, it depends on, on how much, how many votes we give to the, to the shareholders, or how many votes we give to the more intelligent people, so that it has uh, an effect. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely right, and. Um you know, I'm not a paternalistic person. I don't want to run other people's lives. This whole system is not meant to be, we are smart, so we should decide. It's more like, well, they're dumb, so they shouldn't decide. That's, that's really the idea. Uh, it's not that smart people should rule. It's that incompetent groups shouldn't rule. That's the idea. But, but the worry is that, nevertheless, you'll get the smart ruling. And there's a kind of central dilemma that everyone faces when it comes to the allocation of decision rights. It works like this. If I make power widespread, really widespread such that no one has much power, at least when it comes to politics, markets are different. Markets are not like politics, and you know that, but uh, when I make power widespread, I remove your incentive to be selfish, yay, but I also remove your incentive to be smart, so we get nice but dumb. When we concentrate power in the hands of the few, we get the opposite effect. Now you have a very strong incentive to use that power in a, with a lot of foresight because what you do actually has an effect. On the other hand, though, you gain all this incentive to use the power for yourself in self-aggrandizing ways. So we can have either selfish and mean or nice but dumb. And for what it's worth, we actually kind of know roughly where the cutoff takes place. If you have about a one in a hundred chance of being decisive or or lower, like so, like a I'm sorry, a higher higher chance of being decisive than that, then that's when people switch over from being kind of dumb but nice to being kind of coldly calculating and very selfish. So. Any system, like the things that I'm proposing, I think are meant to split the difference. So if, suppose we did a system, there's a form of epistocracy I don't advocate called restricted suffrage. And that one, I, I had a paper defending it at a time, but I no longer am in favor of it. And that one, you only get the right to vote if you can pass a test. The problem is you'll concentrate power probably too much in the hands of the few. It would still maybe be a couple percent of the population, which is statistically enough that they'll vote nicely. But the worry isn't so much that they'll be mean, but that they'll be kind of biased um, in, in other sorts of ways. They won't know about the things that affect others. Um, and we did a kind of plural voting scheme. Plural voting means everyone can vote, but some people get extra votes. If we did that, the worry again is that the power might be too tightly concentrated in the hands of the few, and you could get the same thing. So the nice thing about what I was calling government by simulated oracle is, you're never giving anyone much power. When you show up on election day, you participate as an equal, but you really don't know to what degree you will affect the outcome. And it's really not, it's not really clear you can even tell at the end like what, how many votes you ended up getting. It's just you had equal participation. That's true of everyone. So in effect, what we're doing with government by simulated oracle is we're taking dumb but nice people and we're ripping the knowledge out of their brains and using it without really changing who they are and changing their incentives. So that's my hope. What's that? Yeah, it's like it, right now democracy fails to actually deliver the wisdom of crowds, but this would be a way of like grabbing it from their brains. Yeah. Um, hi, Mr. Warren. Thanks for, for your lecture. Um, I want to ask you not about your book, but you are here and you are a public figure in the libertarian movement. So, um, what do you think about some figure people that like, so libertarian figures like Murray Rothbard or Ayn Rand? And do you think they have they done more harm than good? to the libertarian movement? Yeah, uh, let's see. Oh, that's a great question. Um, and no matter what I say, I'm going to make people mad because there are people that hate them and people that worship them and then people that are in between. And the people that hate them think you should never say anything nice and the people that worship them think you should never think any, say anything mean. 
how would I say this? I, I honestly don't know to what degree they affect the movement because it's kind of a weird movement and it's not clear how intellectuals affect the movement. Um, it's clear that like Ayn Rand appeals to a lot of people, but she also puts a huge number of people off. Uh, Murray Rothbard appeals to a number of people. He also puts people off. If he says things like, you know, smash the state, no gods, no masters, a lot of people are like, yeah, you know, he's got a point that like in the state, states are violent and every form of government is a system in which some people use violence to make other people do what they want. And there's something that really resonates with that. And then when he says things like, if this is my land and I leave my baby there starving, you're not allowed to take a step onto it to remove track the baby. People go, oh, this is a horrific view, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's everything in between. Uh, you know, and I think something like that happens with Ayn Rand. Now, what the overall effect is, I mean, it looks like they made it pretty popular. So it probably it would not be more popular but for them. Um, on the other hand, something I see that's maybe distinct about them is when I think of like the liberal tradition, let's say going back to Adam Smith, it's not that he started it, but he's one of the main people. Um, I think I said this to you earlier, perhaps, you know, Adam Smith, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, what was interesting about that, what was different, what was strange was he said he was one of the first major people to say the way you measure the wealth of nations is not by looking at how much power the king or the queen has or looking at the size of their fleet or the size of their treasury. It's you look at like what the average person has. Does the typical person have a good life? Are their children well fed? Are they going to have a good future? That's what he thought the wealth of nations was. It's an extremely humanistic book. In fact, I like to read quotations from it out of my out of it to my students. And I'll often ask them, who said this? Like, it'll be something criticizing imperialism. You know, he's like bashing the Spanish and the British empires. It's like, this is awful. And I'm like, who do you think said this? And they're like, oh, it has to be Karl Marx because he's the anti imperialist guy. And I'm like, nope, that's the wealth of nations. It was a book criticizing imperialism. That's what it was for. So, the main line, I think, of the liberal tradition throughout most of its history has been about saying that freedom is good for people. It's not just something you're entitled to, but it's good for you. And the thing that I don't like about some of Rothbard's philosophical writings, not so much his economic writings, but some of his philosophical arguments, and also with Rand's philosophical arguments, is that they often lose that message. They think for some reason saying this is good for people is to concede something to the socialists. And they've often conceded what to most people will seem the moral high ground. You know, Rand's like, you know, the problem with socialists is that they think other people really matter for their own sake, and we should just care about ourselves. And she means something very special by that, and it's not as bad as it sounds. But when most people hear that, they, what they hear is, oh, that's what I thought. Capitalism is about just not caring about other people and not caring if the poor starve. And then when they read some of Rothbard's writings, that's what they get from it, too. What the overall effect is on how many people are libertarian, I'm not sure. But I want to kind of take your question and switch it into something a bit different, like kind of hit it over here. Um, somebody asked me yesterday when I was in uh, Barcelona, um, what do they think like the libertarian movement should take from all of this? And what I would say is chapter two in particular of that book is a crash course in voter psychology telling you what makes voters think. And I think the mistake that libertarians make most of the time is that there's an assumption that voters are very cerebral and that they're policy-based. So let's say you're in the libertarian movement and I'm a typical socialist. The kind of thing that you might do to try to convince me to be less socialist is to do something like this. Hey, you say you care about A, B, C, and D, but let me prove to you with economic studies that it turns out that market societies better deliver those goods. And you're right. In fact, you have overwhelming evidence. Like it's the economic profession completely agrees with you on that. It's not just libertarian economists. They all think you're right. So you have the entire economics profession at your disposal. Every paper you give them basically verifies what you say. And the reaction is not, oh, okay, I guess I was wrong. I guess I'll be capitalist now. The reaction is you're selfish and evil ah, and give you a finger and run away. Right? The reason they do that is because they're not actually concerned about outcomes. They're not actually concerned about policy. For most people who say they're socialists, the reason they say they're socialists is because they have socialist friends and it's what it takes to fit in. In the same way that if I want to fit in when I go home, I have to wear Red Sox gear and I can't wear Yankee stuff. Right? Even though uh, this actually isn't true right now, the Red Sox are in the lead. But even though, uh, you know, the problem, okay, the Celtics, I have to use the Celtics. The. Golden State Warriors basketball team is better than the Boston Celtics basketball team. But if I say that when I go home, no one will be my friend anymore. <laughs> That's what's happening for almost everybody in politics, by the way, including a lot of libertarians. 
These are just what it takes to fit in or to be part of your social group. So the idea here is like, once you know that this is what's going on in people's brains, the kind of recruitment strategy has to change. Um, so what you really need is to get like uh, some really cool celebrities to start endorsing libertarianism. And then like the more that people that do it, uh, the more people switch for kind of not random non-cognitive reasons. I mean, that's the problem. A friend of mine once said that the problem with libertarianism is that um, social Democrats have John Lennon and libertarians have Neil Peart from Rush. You know, we need a John Lennon. If we just had that, we'd be way better off. But perhaps that's the, the reason why you, you know, uh, the Bleeding Heart Libertarians, the motto is so, um, what it was, uh, social justice and market. And free markets. And free markets. You know, that's the more or less, I think Capella some, some time ago said that perhaps that's for, you know, for, for being cool and, and being nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's true of all the other people. They just want to be popular. But I, I make sure that doesn't happen by writing books like this one that piss people off. Um, no, actually, I've been on that. I've been surprised at how positive the reaction has been. <laughs> I thought it was going to be much more negative, but it's been pretty positive. I think thanks to the British. So once again, thank you, UK. Um, so, uh, but. No, I mean that that was really written. I think with the mind that there's a very small percentage of people on the left. And, and this is true of other people, I'm not making fun of the left by saying this, that are open-minded and are empirical. And for them, it really is a commitment on the basis of I have these values and I think these policies achieve them and you can correct certain mistakes. But I really think of this as affecting a small number of people and trying to talk to them. It's not about talking to the masses. Um, and, you know, I think to a certain degree, the effect is it's kind of worked. When I look at like the way that academic philosophers right now um, because not just because of people like me or my colleagues but also because of like the sort of previous generation that was sort of bleeding heart but didn't call themselves it like people like David Schmitz or Jerry Gauss or other philosophers they have had the effect of changing the conversation um, and that people don't just say well obviously what libertarianism about is like letting people starve while in order to protect you from taxes they don't say that kind of stuff anymore so it has been having an effect, but I would not use my website as a recruitment strategy to try to get a libertarian party movement going. It's just not aimed at that. Um, so when people are like, as they, I was really saying, like it, it certainly isn't succeeding in that. I'm like, no, and it never will. Right? You got to do dank memes. That's what it takes. There's another issue. I think you don't deal with it in the book, which is about uh, selling your vote, which would connect with the recommendation I want to make to the public that please read all his books because they're really interesting. Market without limits. Uh, if you may do it for free, you may do you may do it for for money. And why not capitalism? Uh, and you have an introduction to political philosophy at uh, Cato, and also an introduction to libertarianism uh, with with Oxford. They, they're all. Uh, Really interesting. But then the, the, the selling your vote stuff is al already being promoted by other people like Posner and Weil in their book uh, Radical Markets. So I wonder how provocative you want it to be because I, I'm sure you saw that the idea of selling uh, your vote. Because you're dealing with the, the main issue is that democracy, you're saying it should be a tool, but for most people it's not a tool, it's a holy cow. Yeah. And here in Spain we had 40 years of uh, dictatorship. If you say you're against democracy, what? You are for dictatorship, you are for authoritarians. Uh, if you try to explain it, you're going the Rothbard way, the full rejection. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, so two good questions. One, I'll, I'll start by coming on that very point about that reaction. This is something that I've noticed. Um, when I go around to certain countries that have had a long history with democracy, a stable democracy, the people there kind of react by being like, you know, I'm not so sure I agree with you, but you've got a good point and it's something worth thinking about. Yeah, at the end of the day, I guess you've at least convinced me, if not of your positive thesis that we should have epistocracy, you've given me a lot of reasons to worry about democracy as it stands, and you've convinced me that maybe I shouldn't see it as sacred. I've gotten kind of that reaction in places like Sweden and the Netherlands and uh, like all the kind of English-speaking countries which have sort of a long, like stable democratic tradition. And then when I go to, say, Germany, the reaction has been, you're not allowed to say that, <laughs> right? 
And it's almost like this kind of thing where I'm, I'm speculating, but it's like, we can't let ourselves think this because we're not, when we think this, bad things happen, right? We have to treat democracy as it's just good no matter what, and you're not supposed to question it. Um, and I thought that was sort of surprising, but maybe it has something to do with their history. Maybe it has something to do with the way that German philosophers think. There's, a, there's some stuff about that. So I'm kind of curious if, you know, with Spanish democracy, with having a constitution from 78 and Franco in power till 75, right, um, that if there will be a similar reaction here. And I don't know, I spent the last two days talking to reporters, I guess a bunch of articles will get written and then we're about to find out. But I wouldn't be surprised if we get that kind of reaction for that kind of reason. Like we're not allowed to think this because you know we've had recent dictatorships. Uh, yeah, that's it. Now, as far as voting markets, this is a super complicated idea. And I can't want to, I could, I could do a whole presentation. I've got, I'm gonna load it up on my uh, computer over there. but. It's worth reading, like, if you're interested, Google this stuff. There are a number of papers out there that argue that if we had the right to sell our votes to one another, this would actually lead to better outcomes for everybody than just giving every one person one vote. And you're immediately going to think, oh, but aren't the poor going to sell their votes to the rich? And the answer is, if you look at the papers, they argue if they did that, that would lead to better outcomes for them. You're basically going to pay people um, for these rights. And if you've taken a lot of economics classes, that won't seem that weird to you. All right? There's this thing in economics called the Coase theorem, which says that it really doesn't matter how the initial distribution of rights occurs. You can give people rights over things at random. As long as they can freely make trades with one another, the outcome will, in the end, be good for everybody, the best possible result for everybody. So in a sense, voting market theory is um, an application of that to votes. Uh, so you can read, just Google it, read papers by people like Richard Posner. There's a nice paper by my friend uh, Christopher Fry and they'll explain to you why, even though this sounds like it has to be the most horrible thing ever, it's a good reason to think it would actually work better. Um, but I'm not going to defend it right now because it would take at least 15 minutes to give an argument, right? Okay, thank you very much, Jason, for, for your lecture and for the following discussion. And Y poco más. Muchas gracias a todos vosotros por, por asistir. Eh, recordad que si no tenéis el libro, eh, lo estamos vendiendo, con lo cual os lo podéis llevar de, de, de casa y además firmado por, por Jason. Y, y poco más. Os, os esperamos la próxima semana. Eh, el, perdón, este sábado. Sábado a las seis en el Instituto Juan de Mariana. Y también espero para la próxima presentación de... Sí, no recuerdo el, el nombre, pero vamos, sobre eh, la represión en, en Ucrania y el conflicto entre Rusia y Ucrania. Eh, y bueno, como decía, os esperamos también, ya será dentro de varios meses, eh, para la próxima presentación del próximo libro de esta, de esta colección, que más allá del de Mariana, el rey de la institución real, que evidentemente no, no lo vamos a presentar con Mariana, será el, el libro de eh, Chandran Cucatas, el archipiélago liberal, también un libro. Ya tuvimos a, a Cucatas hace unos meses en el Instituto Juan de Mariana, esperamos que vuelva para presentar la traducción al castellano de su libro y también podremos tener una discusión muy interesante sobre, sobre el orden liberal. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you.